Hi there. In this lecture, we're going to talk about natural experiments, which is one of my favorite ways of gathering data for epidemiological purposes. Within epidemiology, there is a long tradition going back to John Snow, who is often considered the father of epidemiology. And in the mid-19th century, John Snow used epidemiological methods to investigate an epidemic of cholera in central London. And he collected data within the community and compared it to people who were in another community. The community that he studied was in the area around a water well where people gathered the water for their daily living needs. And those people began dying in large numbers very rapidly from a disease called cholera, which uh, was devastating to them and to their families. And John Snow was able to con collect enough data to show that people who were exposed to a contaminated water well were developing cholera while people who were drinking water from other wells were not. And this provided what we call a natural experiment. The simplest definition of a natural experiment is that the exposure of interest is not controlled by the investigator. It's not manipulated experimentally, but it occurs. And the investigator then assembles a comparison or control condition where there are unlikely to be any exposures and compares the two. This type of research is often recommended as a way of understanding the impact of population level policies on health outcomes, as well as the effects of naturally occurring phenomena like disasters and floods and wars and epidemics that can't be manipulated, but when they occur, we can study their impact on a population. One variety of natural experiment is a quasi-experiment, which is a study to estimate the causal impact of an intervention without random assignment. But the intervention can be manipulated by creating a policy or a program. Both quasi-experiments and natural experiments are subject to concerns regarding internal validity. Because the treatment and the control groups may not be comparable at baseline. So that's an important consideration. In alcohol policy, there are many examples of natural experiments and quasi experiments being conducted to investigate exposures that have been created by natural events or by planned interventions. And we're going to talk about some of them now. Here's an example of a study of a dramatic reduction in alcohol prices that occurred in Finland in 2004. That reduction made it possible for just about anybody to buy large amounts of alcohol. And it could be studied in terms of its impact on the health of the population, which it was. Alcohol-related deaths were found to increase by approximately 16% among men and 31% among women. And the increase was due mostly to cases where the cause of death was a disease of the circulatory system or accidental falls. Also, deaths occurred in alcoholic liver disease where you might expect them. But the combination of high mortality and mortality linked to alcohol-related causes provides powerful evidence when you compare what happened during the um, price rise immediately after it to what happened before or in other countries that didn't have the price decrease, provides powerful evidence that uh, increased exposure caused by price changes could influence population health. This slide shows where 
the changes occurred within population subgroups. The figure shows that uh, the numbers of acute and chronic alcohol-related deaths per 100,000 person years among men and women 15 years or older by age group before and after a reduction in the price of alcohol. Group A in the upper left-hand quadrant represents acute mortality among men. The B quadrant reflects chronic mortality among men. And in the lower quadrant, you have C, which is acute mortality among women, and chronic mortality among women. Before the reduction, the price of alcohol uh, was high enough to limit consumption in most of the population. But alcohol-related mortality was still highest among men 45 to 74 years old. Following the reduction in price, the increase in mortality was highest, more than 25%, in the 55 to 59-year-old age group and in the 65 to 69-year-old age group. It also increased among males under age 35. So here we have a way of disaggregating the effect to particular age groups. Here's another example of how changes in exposures dictated by changing conditions can increase or decrease mortality rates. In Alaska in uh, 1983, there was a tax increase which increased the price of alcohol. With that tax increase, you could monitor what was happening to all-cause uh, mortality as well as alcohol-related mortality. And what happened was, as you can see, a sharp decline in the mortality rate of alcohol-related diseases. And that decline over the years between 1983 and 2003 was reversed as perhaps inflation compensated for the increase in, in price caused by taxation to the point where people had more disposable income to buy more alcohol. In 2003, uh, the tax was again increased. And after that, you found another decrease in alcohol-related mortality. This is powerful evidence that the price of alcohol increases exposure to alcohol or decreases exposure depending on whether the price goes up or down, and that that affects alcohol-related mortality. Another study which represents a natural experiment is the changes that occurred in the United Kingdom in alcohol licensing policies. Alcohol licensing allows hours of sale, it allows the conditions of sale, and when enforcement increases, the sales of alcohol to uh, underage minors and to intoxicated patrons decreases, thereby protecting those groups from alcohol-related harm. In the UK, Licensing data were used to identify local areas where increased licensing enforcement was introduced in 2011. And they also identified areas where the increased enforcement was not put into place. So there were five communities where increased enforcement could be clearly identified, and 86 control communities where it was not. These communities weren't randomly assigned, but they were created and found to be comparable. And what was found is that the intervention, in this case enforcement of alcohol licensing and restrictions on availability and drinking, was associated with an average reduction in alcohol-related hospital admissions of 6.3%.
as well as a reduction in alcohol-related violent crimes. The conclusion, moderate reductions in alcohol-related hospital admissions and violent and sexual crimes are associated with the introduction of greater enforcement of alcohol licensing policies. Another study, this one conducted in North Carolina in the USA. In 1978, there was a change in state law which uh, went from people not being able to drink alcohol in restaurants to a liquor by the drink law that allowed people to purchase alcohol one drink at a time. A quasi-experiment was designed where they looked at the changes over time as people more and more were able to purchase alcohol in restaurants. And what they found was a 16 to 24 percent increase in the number of police reported alcohol related accidents and single vehicle nighttime crashes among male drivers 21 years of age or older. And there was no change in alcohol related accidents for counties where liquor by the drink was not available. The conclusion, single vehicle nighttime accidents involving male drivers was affected by the greater availability of alcohol. One more study to provide an illustration of what happens when there are changes in uh, policies or programs that are evaluated in natural experiments. A Brazilian study was conducted, published in the American Journal of Public Health in 2007, that evaluated the impact of a new law in the city of Diadema, which is an industrial city near Sao Paulo, Brazil. And the new law mandated that all on-premise alcohol outlets close at 11 p.m., mostly bars, but also restaurants. They couldn't serve alcohol after 11 p.m. Prior to the law, most bars traded for 24 hours a day. Restaurants could stay open late into the night. And on weekends, there was uh, a tremendous influx of intoxicated people to the emergency departments, the hospitals, the battered women's shelters, uh, who uh, were drinking in these on-premise outlets. What the study found was that uh, there was a significant reduction with the closure of alcohol sales at 11 p.m., which amounted to, at least in terms of violent crime, a reduction of nine murders a month in this small city. And Diadema at the time had the highest murder rate in Brazil. The figure shows how closing our restrictions dramatically reduced the homicide rates. And it wasn't just the homicide rates. At the same time, there were reductions in hospital admissions and shelters for battered women. What is the conclusion? Well, uh, natural experiments provide a powerful way of assembling evidence that in every way is as convincing as randomized clinical trials that can be used to evaluate upstream interventions that uh, are capable of having a very strong population impact, either by increasing or decreasing exposure to alcohol and drugs. In 1979, uh, James McKinley became very frustrated with the medical model and the randomized clinical trial. And he used the analogy of a rapidly flowing stream, which uh, was carrying people with uh, life-threatening uh, risk factors, in this case being pushed into the water, downstream. And what he did in this analogy was to indicate that many of our health measures are mainly devoted to pulling people out of the stream downstream. 
and sending them to the hospital to be cured. What we should be doing is looking upstream. What is pushing people into the stream in the first place? And what he concluded was that it was often the environment that is created by social and economic conditions, whether it be a policy or uh, that liberalizes uh, the availability of alcohol or, or a drug like marijuana, or a policy that restricts uh, availability. And when those exposures change, you can see changes in the number of people who downstream wind up being pulled out and sent to an emergency room for treatment. So natural experiments and quasi-experimental studies can help us to study health from an upstream population perspective and provide valuable evidence to policymakers.